G'day everyone. In November 2018, the Queensland branch of the AEVA held the EV Expo at the Brisbane Convention Centre. This uh, displayed a wide range of electric vehicles and had a bunch of presentations from experts in the industry. And this video is just a couple of those experts and what they had to say. If you're interested in coming to the Queensland branch monthly meeting, it's at on the third Wednesday of each month at 7.30 at the Albion Peace Centre. I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you on the next one. Right, so our first speaker, so uh, we're now into the, uh, the real trains, planes, automobiles uh, piece. Um, right in amongst it, our first speaker is going to tell us about the uh, Byron Bay Solar Train. Um, it's Nick Lake and Nick's the co-founder of the Energy Lab. Um, based down in Sydney. Um, an energy lab is uh, effectively an incubator and accelerator of um, new business technologies and initiatives, hoping to move Australia toward 100% sustainable clean energy solutions. So to tell us about the solar train, please put your hands together for Nick Lake. Yeah, so outside of Energy Lab, I've also been involved in the solar industry for over um, 10, 12 years and live down near Byron Bay and uh, <clears throat> the Elements Resort owner Brian Flannery, who's uh, a Brisbane local, uh, had this vision uh, from his uh, coal mining days, he's still involved in coal, uh, had a lot of knowledge about railway and a passion for railway. There's an old disused railway line, um, New South Wales State, Ra State Railway line runs through from Casino up to Mwoolumba and goes right through Byron Bay. So uh, Brian's resort is uh, almost on that uh, railway line there on the north side of Byron. So um, over a number of years he negotiated uh, a lease over that section of track from uh, the Byron Bay Arts and Industrial Estate area down into central Byron, uh, which is about a three and a half kilometre run, and uh, had the vision to put a, a um, heritage train on. Uh, the locals though, being a green council and whatnot, weren't too keen on an old diesel train running through their backyards. The, um, fairly uh, high property values there, getting used to not having trains run through there and had basically direct access to the beach. So the train line runs right along the back of the beach there. Uh, so then the vision of a solar train um, was born and that's when I got involved. So I'm just going to run through the, the technicalities of what was involved in the project, some of the um, equipment that we've used. Uh, but yeah, that was the background and um, you know, Brian's been very, very happy with the results. It's been running now for a year. Uh, great utilisation rates for both locals and tourists. Uh, it's only a short run, it's 10 minutes, um, fairly slow. Just goes through the back of um, the beach there through some very pretty little wetland areas. But, um, yeah, it's a great ride. So if you're down in Byron, come and have a go of it. Um, I'll run you through how we, how we did it. So the, um, the challenge was moving a 70 tonne 1949 two car rail um, with electric drive and, and solar. So we had to really think through what the energy uh, requirements were going to be of that train. Uh, we had to accelerate, you know, no uh, Tesla acceleration required here, but uh, we did have to move the train up to 40 to 50 kilometres an hour in uh, 30 seconds. At the moment there's no stops along the way, but in the future there's going to be um, probably next year a stop at the um, caravan park at Belongil and possibly one more. So there's going to be um, increased energy demand, uh, energy usage by the train as um, those new stations go in. But um, the calculations show that we only required around four kilowatt hours per run without the, the other stops at the moment. So not much energy really, and so solar was a real option. Uh, we explored the market and we wanted to keep the heritage form of the train. So we've, um, you know, we're first looking at canopies over the roof of the train and um, having you know, traditional PV ma um, panels mounted over the top, but it was going to really destroy the heritage value. So we um, ended up using a, a new panel by um, a Chinese company called Sunman, which was uh, owned by Dr. Xi. He was the founder of SunTech and once the richest man in China, but uh, yeah, fantastic um, solar engineer. Uh, and that's a flexible panel, it's in a polycarbonate, so it's a full silicon crystal cell, so we get the full efficiency of a normal solar panel, um, but with a degree of flexibility that just allowed it to hug the roof line, and there's a shot coming up in a moment that'll um, show you those panels. 
We can only fit about six and a half kilowatt, um, kilowatts on the roof though, so it was a fairly um, tight space. There's lots of vents and, and old bits and bobs on the roof of the trains. So then we, uh, alongside the, the roof of the train, put a 30 kilowatt solar array on the main shed and um, station. Uh, and then when the train is at that northern end, it can plug in. We've got dual 22 kilowatt uh, chargers, so it gets a good zap and it's not using much. When it's up at that end, it's there for usually 20 minutes, so there's plenty of time to top up. But uh, we've put 77 kilowatt hours of batteries. Shall I start to move through some slides here? So these are the main components as I'm talking through. You can see the solar panels. That's an um, artist impression early on, a uh, photo of how it actually looks in the end. Uh, so those are the panels. Um, my old business, uh, Nickel Energy, um, we did the solar work. And then uh, El Mofo, which is uh, Brett Sutherland's business from Newcastle. Um, Brett's famous for converting a DeLorean, a Back to the Future car, to electric. Uh, it's a beautiful car. And he's also done a number of race cars, actually. In uh, 2014 um, race season, he had a, a radical car, um, full electric, racing against petrol cars that season. And was actually starting to win some rounds. I think by the fourth round, he, he won it outright. And the, the guys weren't too happy about that. So then they extended the length of the race, so basically knocked him out. <laughs> So uh, he got sabotaged, but uh, he proved the point, you know, electric power is um, a dominant power force for that series. Uh, so Brett, um, I knew quite well, um, and I got Brett involved for the, uh, for the electrification side, worked alongside Brett. So we're a great team. We also had Lithgow Railway um, work here, a workshop. They were a heritage railway workshop down in Lithgow where the train was based, and they did the um, major rail restoration side on the two-car train. Uh, and then got involved in how do we modify this and fit in these modern components into um, such a beautiful old chassis. Um, so that's the main components there. You can see we used um, Kiba 22 kilowatt chargers. Um, on board we used uh, Bruiser. Uh, actually, we'll go through this in a bit more detail here. Oh, I won't go right through this slide, but there's a lot of the engineering that we were looking at to how to size this and what sort of power we would need to, um, to deliver that acceleration and, and move that amount of um, weight, uh, 70 tonnes. And the one motor wasn't quite enough, so we ended up with a dual motor design, which has actually been a stroke of genius because at times um, a number of the components we've utilised were a bit uh, new or experimental. Uh, and we've had breakdowns on one side or the other, but one drivetrain is able to push the train along. So the tourists, you know, cruising along at 40k an hour don't know that it's um, only running on one motor at uh, times, including right at the moment. It's only got one side operational. Uh, but um, it's, it's been um, off diesel the whole time. It's, uh, it's been a, a, an effective process. It's definitely delivering um, for the owners and, uh, yeah, not using any fossil fuel. Um, but the dual system has given us that redundancy. But in the photo you'll see there is twin Parker motors. They're a US electric motor and deliver a great amount of torque, as you can see. And then the, the um, large red gearbox we had custom made to, to suit the train. So uh, the full uh, old diesel engine and gearbox was removed and a, a new custom one, as you can see there, fitted in. Um, we put it, no photo of it, but the whole unit fitted into a... a um, skid plates so we could just forklift it under and bolt up into the train and fit it right into where the diesel engine was. We actually used the old radiator system of the train as the cooling. Um, so you have some utilisation of the old and the new there. Um, so these are the traction inverters that we used. Um, and they were running a voltage of uh, 410 volt DC on the um, battery pack and converting that over to their 150 kilowatt um, traction inverters. Um, and then there's a fair amount of regenerative braking, which has uh, been really fantastic to um, stretch the uh, need for the energy. So we're getting around uh, over 25% to 30%, I think, on the, on the regen braking. Um, so Brett built the battery packs. Um, Brett uses Kokum um, cells, which are made in Korea. Uh, fantastic cells, but uh, yeah, he's, he's got a brilliant um, oil cool design there, so they're actually in an oil bath. That's part of the cooling system. They've got their own circulation pumps and whatnot. Uh, and as you can see there, the stats and the weights are um, 150 kilos per pack. 
We had uh, two packs for each of the motors, so they're completely independent um, drivetrains. Uh, battery management system by Batrium, which is another Newcastle fellow, I think is here today somewhere, not with us, yeah. Um, but yeah, so battery management system has been um, brilliant in just analysing cells. We've had a few lazy cells we've had to um, remove and replace over the um, course of the year. But uh, yeah, highly recommend Batrium as a, a locally made um, software for, uh, for the, and hardware for the um, battery management. And then the charging, as you can see, that's a beautiful shot of the, the solar array on the um, main roof, also of the train, but also the roof of the, uh, the garage. Uh, <clears throat> we've used um, 30 kilowatts of Trina Solar and, and Fronius inverters there, but going through those um, Kiba chargers, we can get um, you know, 44 kilowatts going in with the dual chargers, so it's a pretty rapid charge. It um, certainly more than it meets the needs of the train. Uh, there is talk that the train might extend out to Mullumbimby, which is a fairly flat run, or even up to Bangalore. But it's a bit of a climb to get up to Bangalore, so we'd probably have to revise our numbers to make sure we can get up that gradient. Uh, but that's really beyond the scope of the current owner. So uh, Brian Flannery's you know, um, interest was really about getting tourists to the resort and, and to his, um, his set up there. Uh, but there's um, been so much um, positive reviews and great response to the project that there is some um, um, possible interest from the state government that they might open up those tracks. But the big investment is in restoring the old rail. Uh, there's um, talk of a rail trail and whatnot happening down in Byron too. But um, it'd be great if the train could extend up to Bangalore. Be good. Uh, so some of the challenges. It was all about testing this year. We hadn't um, run this, you know, before it was a world first uh, to, to actually move heavy rail with a, a solar design. Uh, so there was um, a few innovations needed to be done. The high voltage um, represented a challenge for uh, industry components for solar chargers and charge controllers. So we had to specify, we, uh, we tracked down a uh, manufacturer in China, Powtech, who um, you know, met our specifications and could design and build a, those components for us. And then you can see the yellow skid that we ended up fitting all this into. So that can be just slipped in under the train and lifted up and bolted in to where the old diesel engines were. So there's a, a fair bit of um, uh, work it out as we went along uh, to this project because it was um, the, the train, the challenges were the three locations. The train was down in Lithgow. Um, the electrical engineers um, were in uh, Newcastle and then uh, we were up here on the solar. So uh, just getting the three teams together and nutting parts out was... Um, so a unique challenge. We had plenty of teleconferences. And then, yeah, blending it in. So this is now sitting in the driver's um, carriage uh, compartment. And looking at those old controls, uh, you can see, you know, two thirds, one third. It wasn't um, all that uh, precise back in those days. But yeah, and then the, the modern controls where you can see the um, MoTeC uh, down the bottom of that picture with the uh, half circle um, shaped dial. Uh, that's the, the MoTeC um, gauges there, so that gives fantastic um, information around the train systems, the temperatures of each of the components, what the oil um, in the battery uh, cooling system is running at, all that. So the driver has got that there. Um, we've done a, a lot of training, uh, so these are old rail um, drivers that we've um, had to, to run through all these new systems and they're doing the safety checks and and system checks daily to make sure that the train's running um, to specs. But they've really engaged well with the project and uh, taken it on um, with passion, which is great. So um, yeah, there's a, a lot of interest from those, uh, the drivers that, who are all volunteers um, to, um, to see it run further and you know, become a bigger part of the public transport in that area. I guess that's um, a big part there too, that this has become a solution for public transport issues in Byron Bay. Uh, coming in from the north side, from Brisbane into Byron, there's um, constant traffic jams. Um, the road's only a single lane road in, so on weekends it can get banked right up, and this is offering a park and ride solution. So it's out on the north side, out in the industrial estate area there. Um, people can park there and just easily catch the train in and not have to deal with the uh, metered parking in Byron and, and the um, congestion that's happening down in Byron these days. So. 
Um, it's a genuine solution to that issue and it's, uh, that's why it's really tweaked the interest, I think, of the, the local councillors and how do they um, try and get those old tracks going again to extend it. But uh, yeah, you can see the beautiful form of the train. It was a, it was a great, um, great chassis to, to work with and the restoration was done uh, so well inside that they're now running parties. The, the resort are catering uh, for parties so you can have weddings and all sorts of things inside the train. It's, um, yeah, it's been a good well-utilised um, project. But, uh, happy to field questions. Um, oh, I'll do it at the end? Sorry, Chris. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah. Thanks. So our next speaker is going to talk to us about uh, electric aircraft. Uh, it's, it's Ron Hoffman. Um, Ron's from an organisation called Eviation. Uh, Ron is uh, an ex-Israeli Air Force pilot um, who's uh, the founder of an Australian-based um, organisation called Blue Kayak Adventures. Uh, Blue Kayak Ventures, not Adventures. Uh, Ventures. Um, and he's working with Isra Israeli startups um, in the Australia and APAC region. Um, and supporting Eviation is one of their key partnerships at the moment. So to tell us all about electric aircraft, can you please put your hands together for Ron Hoffman? How do you know there's a pilot in the room? There you go. He'll tell you. All right. So uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, Ron has mentioned, and I'm here to talk about Another aspect of uh, electrification, if you like, of our transport uh, options, other than just their vehicles. So Aviation, um, an Israeli startup um, that is part of what I call a revolution uh, in the um, aviation space, what I would argue is also a natural evolution as we're seeing in the uh, electric vehicle space, uh, in the uh, aviation space. Um, and for this size, category, range, type of platform, and I'll explain what I mean by that, um, the Aviation Alice aircraft is the uh, first fully electric designed from the scratch to be electric, uh, fully electric propulsion system uh, aircraft. So there's a vision behind this madness, and that vision is to try and make our um, regional aviation transportation options not really free, but much more cost effective than it is today. And, and I'll say, I'll, I'll try to explain why this is important. Um, we are all familiar with this uh, scenario going back uh, from uh, work or going to work. Um, gridlocked uh, roads, uh, it's only expected to be worse and a lot of us are now commuting um, a good share of time in the car to work. We live far away, we commute uh, over an hour each direction. Um, we're trying to solve that problem with this. And again, I'll, I'll explain, we'll get to it. We have some more time. Um, so. We have to explain why we think there's a problem within our regional uh, aviation space, why I would argue it's, um, it's a broken space, okay? Um, and there's a number of factors that contribute to it. I will touch on some of them. By no means is this uh, an academic research that covers everything, but uh, these are the factors and the drivers that we see uh, that are responsible for the problems we have with um, regional aviation. So first off, the infrastructure, the airfields themselves um, are underserviced um, and uh, there's a big challenge in terms of infrastructure uh, in those regional um, airfields. Um, most of us, when faced with the prospect of doing a uh, uh, road trip of four hours, the option of, of going and taking an aircraft uh, usually doesn't cross our mind. Uh, it's not really an option today. Um, and it's interesting to see that uh, out of billions, literally billions of um, uh, regional 
travel trips that we take, whether if it's for road trips or for commuting to work, um, only a very small fraction of those trips, under 3%, will be carried by uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, another important reason, of course, is economics. Uh, the general aviation space is mostly responsible for the regional um, aviation uh, transportation opportunities. Um, cost drivers such as fuel costs that are only rising and are a major factor within the cost basis of uh, owning and operating and trying to make uh, money out of uh, operating aircraft in the general aviation space. Maintenance, a very high driver uh, as well of cost. Um, and the average age of the aircraft that you will typically see in general aviation, in regional aviation routes, um, is not an age that you will be uh, willing to drive your car, right? So they're very old, um, and which again compounds the uh, cost uh, challenges. Land transportation within what we define as a region, and I'll explain what a region is, uh, is almost the default option. There's not really a viable alternative um, to that. So uh, we're saying here it's our solution, but to be honest, any electric aviation solution within this category range, and there's two, um, is aiming to change this reality. And the main driver for changing this reality is economics. Uh, by going all electric in the aviation space, we are able to reduce um, a substantial portion of our uh, cost basis in the um, operating hours, and that's the big factor in operating an aircraft. So we're talking at around 70% reduction in your um, hourly cost, and that's mainly when you're comparing fuel compared to the electric charging, uh, but also the maintenance, because the, um, if anybody here has had experience with uh, um, um, piston engines or turboprop engines that are used in this uh, space, uh, the engines are very complex, uh, and the maintenance uh, costs and, and, and operations around that are pretty significant. Funny enough, with an electric engine, they become very simple, they become more reliable, and therefore, that's another element within the cost reduction. So uh, that, that's good. Now, why is that interesting? It's very good for the operators of the aircraft, but it's very good for us. Because now, the cost of airfare can significantly be driven down, and that can either translate to much better margins for the operator, but hopefully it will also translate into uh, much more cost-effective alternatives um, in, in the regional space, so much so that next time you will contemplate a road trip of four hours, uh, there really is a viable option of going on an electric aircraft. Um, it's not just about, if you would look at uh, Australia, for example, and the network of, of air routes that, that are being used today in the regional space, so it's not just about making the existing network much more efficient in terms of cost effectiveness. It is, but it's not just about that. I would argue that the more interesting uh, prospect with this is that there is a whole new, bigger network that was never contemplated, that was just never dreamt of as something commercially uh, feasible that now we can start looking at and have new connections and new networks that suddenly make sense. And this is because of uh, uh, electric aviation. So I promise to explain what region means and I'll also expand the discussion, um, a bit of a snapshot on, on what's electric aviation. So electric aviation is not limited to the regional space. On the spectrum of, of what I'm familiar with in uh, electric aviation. We have on the one hand um, something that's already commercial today, and I'm surprised we don't see it yet in our major CBDs, uh, but anything that is in your urban space, personal craft, maybe one up to four passengers, 
flying car, if you like, vertical takeoff uh, and landing type of drone solution. A lot, a lot of uh, commercial entities, from big Uber to small startups, are working in that space. There are already commercial deployments um, in many places in the world, and it's just a matter of time until we see that here. This urban space is probably up to four passengers, up to 100 miles. That's what it is, half an hour flight. That's what it is. Uh, the battery technology is very mature, very much there, and again, there's already commercial solutions. On the far end of the spectrum, uh, there's companies that are working on uh, an Airbus 320 or a Boeing 737, all electric. So I would argue that's pretty, um, it's not mature yet, it's pretty far away, it will get there, but it's not gonna happen tomorrow. Where the battery technology is very much now uh, mature enough and allows us to start exploring is where Eviation and another company called Zunum uh, are currently developing their platform, and that's in the 1,000 to 1,500 kilometer range. Um, 10, 15 passengers or one to two tons of usable payload. Um, and, and the fact that the battery technology is, is such that it allows us to carry these capacities at relevant efficiencies and speeds uh, to ranges of 1,000 kilometers unlocks a very interesting potential in the regional space, which is defined at between 100 miles and 600 uh, or 700 miles. Again, to, to try and color that in, in things that we do you know, day by day, if we were to drive from here to, to maybe Gold Coast, we'll take a car, right? If we're gonna fly to Bangkok from Brisbane, we're probably gonna fly on a Boeing or, or an Airbus. That, that's what you're gonna do. But if you're um, gonna uh, fly regionally further than Gold Coast, but within Queensland, um, you will suddenly have opportunities that are as cost effective as taking a train or taking a bus or taking your car. Um, and the network will expand in such a way that you will really have relevant options there. So I can't really be in an electric vehicle uh, a conference without, uh, I just wanted an excuse to put this uh, picture. So who knows what this is? Yes? Yes. Yeah, so that's the Starman Roadster somewhere out in space. And other than, it's a cool picture and I wanted to have it here. There's a reason. Um, so there's two approaches to um, this 1,000 kilometer range regional uh, category uh, electric aircraft. One approach is hybrid, uh, and that's Zunum, an American company. Uh, one approach is all electric, and that's Aviation, uh, the Israeli uh, company. Uh, and to be honest, there's good um, arguments to be made for, for either one, and to translate it to uh, a language which is relevant for electric vehicle uh, conference, one is developing a Prius, Toyota Prius, uh, while Aviation is developing a Tesla, uh, because it's all electric, uh, both great cars, different approaches uh, to, um, to going electric. So, as explained, uh, the Aviation solution uh, is an all electric, built by design to be electric uh, aircraft, um, and again, the intention is that we will now have more options available for us uh, that are comparable commercially to decide how we want to go about um, going from point A to point B within a region between 100 miles and about 700 miles. So, introducing Alice. This is the aircraft. Um, just, we have to put some music in. Um, so again, Israeli startup. Um, the aircraft is very, very advanced. It's fly-by-wire, like advanced fighter jets, which makes it safer to fly uh, and uh, easier to fly, by the way. Um, and there's pressurized and unpressurized versions, and, and I'll talk about different uh, variations of that. Um, pretty good-sized platform, and I'll show you some examples of 
platforms you may know uh, that are similar in uh, size. Free engines, so even safer. My wife doesn't let me fly on anything less with uh, less than uh, two engines. Um, and all composites, I will touch shortly on where is the innovation, and that's part of that the innovation. Uh, shout out to Kokam because it was mentioned before as pretty good batteries, so there's a subtext of a good battery supplier here. Happy to hear that. Um, and we'll also talk when the first flight is expected to take uh, place. So, where is the innovation here? Uh, the innovation is, um, it's the, again, it's the first that's built to be electric. To build to be electric means that you can make the most of the possible efficiencies rather than plugging an electric engine on an existing air platform. By the way, you can do that, but you're really limiting your performance. You're not, you're by, you're, you're, you're not efficient at all. Not slightly not efficient, you're heavily not efficient. Um, so electric by design allows you to build a platform that's very efficient, that is able to offset the weight of the batteries, which is about 60, 65% of the weight of the aircraft, uh, by designing a platform that um, with today's technology uh, is with advanced composites, is very sturdy and strong, but light. Um, um, of course, the, uh, um, we're using uh, lithium-ion uh, batteries, uh, and the technology there is also part of what allows us to do taking this mass, six and a half tons of, of aircraft and passengers and payload, a thousand kilometers. Um, and the aircraft is also built to be, the avionics is very advanced, so it's built to be unmanned as well. So this, the, I would argue that the regulator is not yet ready for that, but uh, potentially in the future it can also be unmanned. Initially it will be one or two pilots depending on the uh, operator. So, a bit of more information on the Alice. Uh, it's a very fast aircraft, so 240 knots. Uh, that's, that's as fast as, as most of your fast turboprops today. Uh, so, it has the speed, it has the capacities, it is a bit limited on range compared to other turboprops, but interestingly enough, um, most of the, so when you look at in the USA on the, um, all the flights that are being carried in the USA, 70% of them are under 600 miles in range. So actually the bulk of our air travel is not 12 hours to New York or to wherever we're flying, it's Melbourne, Sydney, and potentially in the future from regional centers, uh, not necessarily through the uh, major hubs. Um, that's a nice picture of the cockpit. Now, I'm not sure how much you guys are familiar with the cockpit. So, I flew G550. That's a, a very advanced business jet, uh, and it has a very advanced cockpit. This is an, a, as advanced an avionics suite in the cockpit as you will find on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. So, um, it's, uh, it's really state of the art. Um, some images of how it looks inside. So, here you have two comparable uh, size category platforms that are pretty common all over the world um, that are very similar in size to the Alice. So on the one hand, we have uh, Beechcraft B200 or B350. So a lot of the charter operators in Australia use that. Uh, your Royal Flying Doctor Service uses this platform as well. Um, and of course, Royal Australian Air Force is using that for training. Very good aircraft. Um, but just to kind of understand where we are in size, the other platform there is the uh, Pilatus PC-12, the high end in terms of performance and price. And uh, uh, again, a very good platform that you see a lot of. The Alice is comparable in uh, size um, and in performance to this type of platforms. By the way, price-wise to buy, you're looking at something very comparable to these ones, probably even cheaper, uh, but the cost savings are really in the 20, 30 years that you operate the aircraft and 70% less in the hourly operating cost. Um, applications, uh, if you 
if you you're interested. So this is very much for uh, commuter, regional airlines type of uh, uh, passenger carrying, but this is also for freight. Being um, electric means you're also um, not noisy at all. And freight operators operate at night. A lot of the time they're limited by noise abatement restrictions so we can get our beauty sleep. Um, but with the electric aviation, there's more opportunities for freight operators to operate at night that they couldn't operate uh, uh, if they're not electric. Um, I mentioned Royal Flying Doctor Service, Medivac uh, operations. This is very much relevant for that. By the way, in a Medivac configuration, you can extend the range to close to 1,500 kilometers. So uh, it's, it is pretty interesting. Uh, and um, the, it is a, there is a global effort in terms of what the company does, and there is a lot of interest uh, around this type of aircraft. So the aircraft is uh, currently being built, the first uh, batch, uh, where first flight is planned for Paris Air Show, Northern Hemisphere summer, so June, eight months from now. We'll see the first ones flying. Um, and the FAA, that's the American CASA, uh, so that's the regulator that makes sure that whatever it flies and we're sitting in it is safe. Uh, so that's a long process, but by the end of 2020, maybe early 2021, uh, this aircraft is already FAA certified uh, and with the uh, uh, launch customers in several places uh, in the world. So again, very exciting. Um, cannot talk about electric aviation without mentioning the green impact, although I will argue that the driver here is more so the economics and the cost savings and the efficiencies that we can gain and the new markets that you can open now. Um, but it is a step in the right direction in terms of reducing emissions. Um, if you didn't know, uh, around 4% of harmful emissions in the world are um, uh, associated with aviation, the, the full range of aviation. Uh, so again, I think this is a step in the right direction. There isn't a country today in the world without a zero emissions plan for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, now, this is also very much uh, interesting, I think, for Australia. So the company is very focused globally. I'm focused locally. Um, and in Australia, uh, and in some, by the way, other regions here in, in Asia Pacific, um, I would argue that on top of the commercial element and the friendly environmentally platform, um, when you're starting to think about remote communities here in Australia, uh, this becomes even more interesting uh, and the potential is there to, I think, um, create a positive impact both socially and economically on such remote communities. We can make them less remote because we can make everything that we almost take for granted here in Brisbane or in Melbourne um, uh, more accessible by virtue of it will cost less to get them where they need, to send things uh, there. Uh, this is why this is of interest to governments, federal and state. Uh, of course, for the operators themselves, um, but more so for us as users and, and the remote communities uh, themselves. So, thank you very much for your time.